All right, so like I said, welcome. This is our information session about the Equity and Justice Focused Counselor Training Project. So um, I am Dr. Tiffany O'Shaughnessy. We've got Dr. Julie Cronister here who has unfortunately lost her voice. So I'm gonna be trying to fill in and share the stuff she usually shares. Um, so I'll be reading her slides today. And then Dr. Molly Streer is here. Um, do either of you wanna say anything before we hop in? Just hello, thank you for being here. Great. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Sorry, I can't speak very well today, but it's lovely to see everybody. <laughs> yeah. All right. So next slide. All right. So today we're going to go through, we're going to give you an overview of our project. It's this overarching project that actually has three different stipends um, that come through it. Um, and so we'll talk about what the expectations are. If you do accept one of the stipends, how you apply for them. We'll open up a good amount of space, hopefully, for to get any, answer any of your questions. And then around 1.45, we have some of our partners coming and they'll have about five minutes each to tell you about um, their internship sites, places where you could do your training next year. Um, so I think that's it for this. Next slide. We want to give a shout out. So in addition to myself and Dr. Cronister, Dr. Streer, and then Dr. Fitzgerald runs the um, disability training focus grants. We have amazing graduate assistants this year. Jace Perry, Sarah Guerrero, Kiana Day Smith, and Lennon Fanning are help us out with running this these uh, big, big projects. So thanks to them. I think Jace is here in the room with us today. Really appreciate you being here. So next slide. All right, so a lot of the stuff we're gonna share, you can find on our project website. And, and also we'll be posting this recording and a copy of the slides. And that's important because there's some details in the slides that we're not gonna read all out, but they're important resources for you to have access to for later. So um, you can always get information, most updated stuff at our website, which is the ibhequity.sfsu.edu website. And so this is sort of the structure of our project. So we're all part of the Equity and Justice Focused Counselor Training Project. And within that, we have the Integrated Behavioral Health Training Project. That one's focused on getting folks more involved into integrated behavioral health sites. We have our school-based mental health training project. Um, that one, Dr. Streer is the, the lead on. I should say Dr. Cronister is the lead on the integrated behavioral health one. And you'll hear us refer to these as the HRSA grant or the behavioral health grant. You'll hear us talk about the DOE, Department of Ed, or the school-based mental health training for the other one. And then there's the disability training project with Dr. Fitz and Dr. Cronister. They're going to have a separate meeting because the requirements on that one are a little different. Um, and so, we, but we want you to be aware that there's these three buckets of money you can get. Some, some of them are in your first year, some are in all of your years, some are in your second year, and they have different things that come with them. So um, yeah, they'll, they'll come back to you. Those ones you might hear of as the um, rehab training grants or the clinical mental health training grants. These are some of the ways people refer to them in the program. Um, but so we're going to break it down. I think next I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Streer, who's going to talk about the school-based mental health project, and then I'll come back on to talk about the integrated behavior your health HRSA grant. Thank you, Dr. O'Shaughnessy. So as mentioned, uh, we do have uh, one of these training grants through the Department of Education. Uh, very exciting. This is our first year. It is a five-year grant um, funded by Department of Ed's Mental Health Services Professional Demonstration Grant. And essentially, um, this grant is intended to increase access to culturally and linguistically diverse school-based mental health providers in our partner school districts, which are San Francisco Unified School District and Oakland Unified School District. So um, I briefly looked at you know, several of the folks that are in the room. I think you are already perhaps participating in this grant, which is awesome, and or um, you know, thinking about joining uh, one of our partner districts for your field work in the future. So uh, great opportunities to really increase our pipeline between the training that we can provide here in the department and the you know, access to school-based mental health providers in our partner districts. So we'll hop to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so the expectations of this grant are essentially that you will complete one year of your field work at minimum. So for the year that you uh, decide to participate in the grant program, you will need to complete your field work in one of those partner districts. So in Oakland Unified School District or San Francisco Unified School District. And um, there is, uh, so I don't know if it was on the last slide, my apologies, it's at the bottom, it should be at the top. You're probably wondering, 
what stipend you receive for this, right? So in order uh, for doing that, you will receive a, a $10,000 stipend. Uh, you do receive that sort of in the beginning of, uh, assuming all of the paperwork and everything is complete, you do receive that in the beginning of the year. And that stipend can be used any way that you need to use it to support your graduate training program. So there's really no restrictions on how you utilize that 10K stipend. Um, with that said, there is a service payback component to this particular grant. And so we do ask that for every $10,000 stipend that you receive through this grant, that you commit to a minimum of one year of service uh, in a high needs school-based mental health position. And so we will take a moment to kind of define what that looks like. Uh, we do ask that throughout the project that you are also responsive to our requests for data collection. Uh, we have some reporting requirements through the Department of Education. And so every now and then, it's not a lot, but every now and then we do reach out and ask for some you know, basic information about how things are going with you and um, the completion of your, ultimately of your graduate program, those kinds of things, and then ultimately where you do get employed. So um, you can receive this 10K stipend as many times as you would like, uh, but do know that every time you receive this the 10K stipend, you have to complete that one year of field work in one of our partner districts simultaneously. And then each year is then a commitment to one year in a high need school. Um, with that said, it can be a high need school, public school, I should say, um, anywhere in the country. So it does not have to be uh, specifically in Oakland or San Francisco. So if you are someone that perhaps, you know, is doing your field work in the region, but, you know, you're hoping to return to a different region or go to a different region, as long as you do that service component in a high need school, it will meet our requirements for the grant. So um, I think next slide. So as I mentioned, uh, we have a sort of criteria for what we are describing as a high need school um, based on what the Department of Education, how they define it. And we do know um, in some ways it's a bit limited, um, but essentially when we are talking about a high need school, it is a public school. Um, if it is an elementary school, uh, the threshold is that um, at least 60% of your students are eligible for free or reduced price lunch in California. And so essentially, um, we on our website, I don't know that it's on this uh, PowerPoint, so my apologies, but on the website, we do have access to how you can find that data. And one of our graduate assistants, Kiana, actually did create a spreadsheet that we will make publicly available to you all um, to give you a sense of how many schools this really is. So just so you know, it, it does tend to be a lot of schools, particularly in our partner districts, um, but in many regions as well. Now, if you're not looking at an elementary position because you're in the Bay Area and we don't have that many of them, um, at least for school counselors, I think we have more of them for our clinical school-based folks, but uh, middle and high school, uh, that threshold is for a school that serves uh, no less than 45% of students who are eligible for free and reduced price lunches. So that is how you know that your school would meet the threshold for this service payback requirement of the grant. So again, for every $10,000 you receive through this particular grant, you're committing to one year of service post-graduation um, as a school-based mental health provider. I probably should have started by saying that does include our school counselors, that does include clinical folks. So if you're um, getting pursuing your MFT or your LPCC um, and you are in a school-based mental health setting, that is sufficient. So as long as you're working in that school-based mental health setting, you meet the criteria and the components of this grant. Molly, can I ask one clarifying question there Please, that might always. be relevant for MFT or CMHC students? Mm -hmm. you, you have to be, so the year of service means being employed by a school district, correct? Or being employed by a school? No, it does not. It means that you're based in a school. So you could be employed oh. by a county agency. Um, yeah. So it, as long as you are doing your actual hours in a school-based setting, awesome. it is written in a way that we do include community-based partners that are positioned in schools. Given the nature of a lot of the wellness programs that we have across the state, um, there's definitely a lot of school-based providers that are not employed directly by the school districts. So as long as your hours are in the school and you're serving students and families in that community, it will count towards this grant. Beautiful. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that.
All right. Um, so some other things that I think are just exciting and important to note about this grant. So um, yeah, Joshua, just one moment. Okay, I'll, I'll be right with you. Um, thank you for checking in. So um, one thing that I also think is important to note is that we are um, also providing additional components like through this grant, there's also additional funding going out to our partner districts. And I think it's um, just valuable for y'all to know where that is, is going. And so some of the things that this grant is also supporting is providing stipends for our site supervisors. Um, so Oakland and San Francisco do have some control and leverage over the, the monies from the grant that they're monitoring and managing. Um, and so some of that money is going to provide stipends to your site supervisors. As we know, taking on fieldwork students can be a lot when you're already doing a lot um, through your job. And so we really appreciate and value the partnerships of our state supervisors. And so that is one way of really supporting that partnership as well. We're also providing clinical supervision um, in Oakland at the very least, uh, San Francisco may as well at some point um, in order to support folks who are working towards their licensure and or um, you know, wanting to pursue kind of multiple licenses or credentials. Uh, we do also have an advisory board for this grant. So it's important for you all to know that it is not just the three of us dictating sort of what happens with this grant and how it rolls out, um, but we are proactively inviting the perspectives and participation of, of those leaders and, and folks in both our partner districts, but also at the state level and some of our professional organizations as well through our advisory board participation. Uh, we will also be offering an annual professional development every year through this grant. So our first one is going to roll out this spring, um, and it will be focusing on the advocating student with an environment uh, framework, which will essentially, uh, in short, we're going to be really focusing on skills for uh, working collaboratively and in, in consultative roles with teachers, because as school-based mental health providers, we need to be welcoming and working with teachers in order to really impact not only individual students' experiences, but starting to work on some of the structural and systemic oppression that does occur in schools. If we're gonna really work to change our school systems, we need to be working in partnership with all of the stakeholders. And as we all know, teachers are a very large part of that. Um, so really focusing on how we can do that effectively as school-based mental health providers in the fall. Uh, future professional developments will be determined by our advisory board. So we don't know what year two will bring, but we're excited to let you know when we do. And also we welcome any sort of feedback you may have for us as well. So um, we want this to be an open dialogue about what needs you have as school-based mental health providers and training, what needs you may have once you are out in your field work and or once you become employed. So we want this to be you know, a reciprocal uh, partnership with you too. So we welcome your input and feedback. And if you have recommendations about the way that the grant is rolling out or how we can better support you, we invite that. Uh, Joshua, I think you had a question. Uh, yeah, um, well, it's good to see you again. Hello. Number hi, one. Joshua, then, good to see you too. And then Dr. O, she's my teacher. I just wanted to say hi. Uh, super quick, quick. Also, I'm at my uh, work. So if you hear people screaming, it's just kids and they're, someone's gonna help them, they'll be fine. Uh, I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Two, going back to where you said earlier, I was confused. Is it does does field work like an internship site count, or does it have to be like a job? <clears throat> no, no, no. Yeah, thank you. So for the the first part of it is this this field work, the practicum and internship hours that you are doing to complete your graduate training program with us in the department that counts as your field work. You just need to be doing that field work in Oakland or San Francisco Unified Schools. So that's that first component. So make sure you're doing your field work in those schools and you are eligible for that 10K stipend. Then post-graduation, right? That's where that one year of commitment to a high needs school comes into play. Um, and, and so that, that component, that employment component is there, but that's not until after you've graduated and that does not have to be restricted to our partner districts. All right, cool. Thanks for asking. Any other clarifying questions? All right. I have one actually, sorry. Yeah, oh, okay, go ahead. Sorry if I missed you, I didn't see. No, 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 I just got here. Um, I, I came in a little bit late, but what you said uh, piqued my interest just now. So I am um, I direct the Daily City Youth Health Center. So mm -hmm. uh, we're technically not in San Francisco or Oakland. Some of our clients are. 
but I'm curious, we are, uh, I, I could have sworn, I think we're on the list as an FQHC. Do we as a site not qualify for this or are we one of the sites? Unfortunately, it, it's sort of a complicated answer. I'll try to explain. Unfortunately, so you are listed as our approved site for the Integrated Behavioral Health Project, which is the sec second project that um, Dr. O'Shaughnessy is going to talk about next. Wow. Um, for the Department of Education, unfortunately, for the fieldwork component, it, it does have to be students that are in Oakland Unified and San Francisco Unified. Yeah, so you, you don't actually qualify for the fieldwork component of the Department of Ed grant. With that said, because I know you, correct me if I'm wrong, but you do place people in schools, right, through your yes. program. So for the service payback, our, you know, folks could, could count their time if they were employed by you through a service payback, but it doesn't count for the fieldwork component. However, you are, you know, a part of our, you know, one of our partners for the, the next grant. So, Got it. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you. Thanks for asking. Any other questions about this piece? And we will reserve, we will have a space for Q&A afterwards. So if you, I get into the next piece and you have that, go ahead, we'll, we'll, we'll make space to answer your questions when we get to the end of that. So, okay. So, you know, remember back to the flow chart, you know, justice or counselor training project overall, Dr. Streer just told you about the Department of Education funded one. This is our one that's funded through the Health Resources Services Administration, um, HRSA. Um, and so this, this project um, is has a lot of similar goals. You can see, except it's not school-based, it's working with medically underserved communities more. So our objectives for this grant are to increase the supply of counselors trained in integrated behavioral health, to increase the supply of counselors trained to work with youth from medically underserved communities, and to increase the supply of counselors from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds to work in these integrated behavioral health settings. And so we have a lot of acronyms for this grant. Um, we're going to show you, we, we're, we have some slides that have more definitions on what these are, but really we're trying to get counselors to be in what's called federally, federally qualified health centers, health professions, uh, shortage areas, uh, medically working with medically under serve communities and in rural areas. And so if you think essentially it's getting folks, getting counselors into spaces where they aren't usually at, where people who have the most need aren't able to access uh, behavioral health services. So we are trying to get, have our, our students in our program training at these places. So we're building um, internship placement or partnerships in these in spaces, but also trying to encourage you all to eventually hopefully be leaders in these spaces, working in these things so that we are addressing the really high disproportionate need for mental health services in these communities. Next slide. Um, and so for this one, it's a little different from the way that the Department of Education grant works. So the things that you need to do to get this $10,000, so this is a $10,000 grant as well, um, and the thing you would also get in August of the year that you have this, um, you it's only given during your final year placement. So if you are, if you have an emphasis and you're in a three-year track, right, it would be your third year. It's your final year of internship, usually when you're in the 891, 892, 890, 891, 892 sequence for those in um, training. So um, you would, it's it's your last year, right as you're about to graduate. Um, you uh, need to have a commitment to working in medically underserved communities, primary care settings, or in a rural setting. So saying that you're, you're planning to do that. Um, there are 10 webinars that happen throughout the year. This is that part where we say we're training folks in integrated behavioral health. We have a series of webinars that are actually open to the community and they're continuing education seminars. So people come um, to them, they're an hour long, each. And um, right now we're doing five that are live and five that are pre-recorded. Sometimes that shifts. Um, you can go, you can watch them all as recordings or you can come in real time to them. But really it's these 10 webinars that you you go to that that's, that's your sort of advanced training in integrated behavioral health. So you do an internship. At, at, a, at, a, at an agency that is sort of meeting these criteria. We'll talk about that more. And then you attend these webinars. There is no requirement to, to work anywhere else after graduation, um, but you do commit to, as it says here, responding to Chronister's request for information pre and post graduation. So you do need to tell us where you're working um, and talk to us about how that is 
meeting the needs of medically underserved communities, right? So it doesn't necessarily mean you have to be in a primary care setting or an integrated behavioral health, but we're going to want you to tell us how the people that you're working with are high needs, right? Or youth that are high needs. It's really telling us how the work that you're doing is meeting the needs of the most underserved folks. Um, so I think, Julie, did I miss anything in that? Yeah, Molly added it in. School counseling count, work counts in this, right? So, yeah, I mean, if you are working in a medically underserved or, or if in a um, one of those high need schools, you're serving medically underserved folks, right? So, um, so that works. So, when we talk about what is integrated behavioral health, right? Um, we got a lot of words on here, but it's really saying behavioral health is an umbrella term that includes mental health and substance use um, work, right? So life stressors, crises, stress-related physical symptoms, and health behaviors. So behavioral health conditions often affect medical illnesses. And really this movement towards this integrated behavioral health is trying to treat the whole person, right? To not separate out um, the, the physical health from the mental health, and that to really subsume it all together to have fewer silos. Um, we have some cool videos that we probably won't have time to share that really talk about the ways that trying to meet people where they are, right? Like how some folks may come in for dental work, but they're not going to come in for a mental health treatment. But if you can have spaces that are one-stop shops, then you're more likely to get everyone there. Some of our students are right now working in primary care clinics where they then meet with folks for five or 10 minutes after they've met with their primary care doctor, and they're helping them with, you know, uh, sleep hygiene or with uh depression screenings or things like that, really helping to attend to mental health um, in these primary care settings. So integrated behavioral health, IBH, blends um, all of these things together, behavioral health, medical health, doing that whole person care. You might hear it called integrated care, collaborative care, primary care, behavioral health, no matter what it's called, we're really looking at whole person treatment. And like I said, acronym soup. We love acronyms in this field. And so we're, we're going to put these slides up on the website. So you'll have them if you're ever like, wait, what was a medically underserved community? What are medically underserved populations? So the government does define these. These are the terms that the grant funders have given to us. And so these are the things that we're looking at. Um, but really like fo folks who are unhoused, uh, migrant or seasonal workers, residents of public housing, um, anyone who's working somewhere like Compass Behavioral Health, you're, you're going to be working with these folks. Um, and so really it's anyone who's facing Facing economic, cultural, and linguistic barriers to healthcare is what we're looking at. And then health profession shortage areas, you hear them, people will say HIPSAs. Um, it's a geographic area population group designated to have a shortage of primary medical care, dental, or mental health providers. Um, and so it's often low income populations or um, sometimes uh, indigenous or native health services fall under that. Um, and they, it's, But it's a government definition and there's the link on this thing. It gives you, we've got a list from the government that tells us this is or is not. Yeah, just to add to that, if you can hear me, um, thank you, Tiffany, for such a great explanation. Sorry, my voice is not going well, but that link is really helpful. When I ask for information, you can literally put the address of your site into the link and it will tell you if it's a HIPSA site or MUC or whatever. I know it's a real pain, but just so you know, that's why that link is really helpful. And if you don't do it, I'll end up doing it. But if you can do it, I'm so grateful. Because yep. we got 29 of you a year, and it's a lot of work to put her reports together so that we can give out this $10,000. Um, so yeah, next slide. Okay, so some more definitions, right? What is a federally qualified health center? You heard uh, Dr. Anya Shapiro sort of talking about that. Um, it's a it's a CMS, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid certifi certification that folks can get. Um, that it, So it's, it's sort of saying, again, that they're providing this medically underserved communities. Primary care is a setting with integrated accessible healthcare services. So, so that's, and then rural setting, it's rural, right? So a uh, city and county of SF is not going to be rural, but there are some nearby, like Solano County has some rural things. So as you get up into the North Bay or into the Central Valley, some of those ones start to fall into it. I just want to add one more thing. Primary care definition, a lot of um, students who've received this assume it means this traditional primary care setting, you know, in our primary care, and it's a broader definition. So when I do ask you, are you in a primary care setting, make sure and look at the definition I provide, because it's not just that primary care setting in a doctor's office, um, and it, it, it's an expanded um, definition. Thanks, Julie. 
All right. And so this is just some more information about um, these health centers. And so um, the, you know, thinking about, and again, we have a lovely video and I, now I'm really looking, we're not going to have time to play it. Um, but the, the four key components that we look for in these health centers that help serve, you know, the folks who don't have access are that they're located in areas of high need. So we do have some of these in city and county of SF that they have this comprehensive set of services, right? They're including dental, vision, behavioral health, everything's all together, one-stop shop. They're open to everyone, regardless of insurance status or ability to pay. And, and they have patient majority governing boards. So um, there's it's really about that nothing about us without us sort of mentality and really trying to bring that into. So, uh, you know, they bring some of the disability justice um, concepts into the, the recovery model. Those sorts of things are present in these spaces. So these are the federally qualified health centers in SF County. Um, and so, you know, just again, places you'll see some of these are on the list of areas that you can do internships at. Um, so, you know, again, we're wanting, if you're not doing an internship there, we're also just wanting you to think about these are places that you can be working. These are places that you can move into and to sort of know that, that these exist and, and this is the kind of work that they're doing. I don't think there was much more we wanted to share about that, just sort of raising awareness about it. And then these are the ones that are in Alameda County. Um, so if you're working over where I am here in the East Bay, uh, Lifelong, La Clinica, and a lot of some folks from many of these places are going to be here today to talk about their placements. Um, we don't have placements currently in every FQHC. Not all of them can host our students. Um, but since we've started the grant, we have placements in many more of the FQHCs than we did um, before before it started. Um, so I, I just have to add that there's a uh... A reimbursement structure change. And so I think we're going to see more of you all in these settings more easily as APCCs and AMFTs. Yeah. And so I think on the next, is the next slide still about internship sites? Or, no. So one thing I will say, so we would love for you all to be in FQHCs, you know, Daily City is one, all of these things, but you can't all be there. So you don't have to be in an FQHC in order to get this grant. Um, that's just, there are priorities. We have partners, um, including our school districts, Oakland Unified, San Francisco Unified. So again, places where they're they're serving high needs youth, um, those all count. And so really what we do, we have a, a Qualtrics that you fill out when you apply and you tell us how is your site serving medically underserved communities? How is your site helping to provide, and, or how are you, right? Do you have multiple language competencies? Um, do you come from um, under-resourced communities? Like, how are you helping? How would you being in this site be helping to address the needs of this grant? So you don't have to be at one of our partner agencies, but we really like for you to be there. You're going to meet a lot of them later. Um, that's like the easiest way to get in is to be at a partner agency, but there's a lot of spaces that we haven't, partnerships we don't have. So it doesn't just have to be that, but um, we want you to be, you know, your, your internship will need to be meeting the goals of the grant broadly. So just so we said, right, the things you have to do, you have to finish your internship and you have to attend these webinars. So just a little bit more about what the webinars are. We've had some really amazing webinars over the years. This is our third year of the grant. Am I right? Yeah, third year. Um, and at this point, we, you know, we have had um, the current president of APA, Tama Bryant Davis, came and talked about liberation um, approaches. We've had San Ching came and talked about trans affirmative uh, mental health. We've had some really cool ones on disability justice and how we do that. We've had so it's just um, there's been some awesome school based ones looking at how we do this work better. And so this is the screen cap from our website right now for our stipend recipients this year. Um, we've had two live webinars so far. We've got three more coming up in the spring. Um, you're welcome to attend these even if you don't, uh, if you're not receiving the stipend. We, again, it's open and free to everyone and we record them and make them freely available on our YouTube channel. We've had over 4,000 views of our webinars up to date, which is pretty exciting. So this, the, we're helping to get this equity and justice focus integrated behavioral health message out there. Um, and so the, this is sort of how it works is if you can come in real time to the webinar, that's the easiest because you just sit there for an hour, take in the info, you can do the Q&A if you want, you can interact with that person. And then there's a um, like just a quick survey that you take afterwards that, you know, where you get to say, what did you learn? You know, one or two sentences and, and we can then verify that you did it. 
we know we can't schedule them to match every, you know, 35 people's schedules. And so we also record them all. And then Lennon right now is our, our website, a grad assistant. He posts it up on YouTube and then posts it on this page. So you, all of these have the links to the YouTube. You watch the YouTube in the comfort of your own home, whenever it works for you. And then there's that big purple link there. You click that and you fill out the Qualtrics survey that tells us that you did it. And that's how we track that you completed the 10. So that's what this looks like. You can see some of our presenters for this year and 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 the kind of topics that you can that you get to learn um, learning more about this public health care dealing with ableism um, trans affirmative care supporting justice involved youth right so so interesting topics that we bring in our final one and we've just started finalizing that one is going to be from the group safe and sound looking at moving from mandated reporting to community supporting which I'm very excited about um, based on actually a presentation in my law and ethics class this year so super super pumped for that one to be our fifth one for the year. Okay, so how do you apply? And I think this is a similar, it's a similar process for the DOE grant too. There will be a, there's a one page Qualtrics application that's that's on our website. Um, and if you go to our website, you'll see there's a um, stipend information. It's not due until mid-April. And so you don't have to do it right now. The thing you all should be paying attention to now is a, finding an internship that is you know, relevant to this thing. So, um, but once you have your internship, you then submit the one page app, Qualtrics application. Yep, so yeah, once you have it, you submit that. Um, and then there's a student commitment form. And so it'll tell you sort of everything you're agreeing to do, which are the things we just said, come to the webinars, um, respond to emails about what you're doing, um, be committed to working with these groups. Um, we review all of the ones that we've got in, and then you'll get an email notice of, that you've been awarded this $10,000. If you're awarded that, there's two forms that you'll have to fill out via DocuSign, and then you get a check for $10,000 in August of 2024. So pretty, pretty simple. And this is what the training agreement forms look like, just so you have a heads up, right? It's like a one page thing that kind of says, you know, I'm enrolled at SF State. Um, I will do the thing, I'll do the training modules. I am taking my final year internship, right? I'm going to provide updates. There is one here. You do need to be a citizen, national, or permanent resident of the United States. Um, we have tried to see if there's any way for us to get around that. Uh, we thought there was on our Department of Education grant, and then we found out there is not, uh, which is very, very distressing. Um, but because it's all funded from the, the federal government, that's a requirement, and there's no flexibility for us on that. Um, and so, so, but this is what it'll look like. And that's, that's the grant. So we've got about 10 minutes if there's any questions from you all about this. Erin, great question. Is there a service requirement for this? No, for the integrated behavioral health one, there is no service requirement post-graduation. Good question. Well, there's just a commitment. <laughs> Yeah, there's a, an intention, a commitment, a, a, an agreement that you're going to try. All right, Alexia. Did you mention that if there was like a, like a, if it has to be an SF or Oakland or not for this one? I'm sorry, I missed not, that. Not for this one. It does not. So I know you're located in Santa Cruz. Um, like I said, we don't work so much with the that area, but if if your agency sort of seems like the agencies that are here, right, if where you're going is doing the sort of integrated behavioral health work, then that's when you apply and you submit that info to us. And then we would we would be able to, you know, let you know if you're approved. Thank you. And I'll also say if you're as you're working through, I know we're usually open to this. Like if you're looking at, I want to maybe this internship versus this one for my for my final year, you're welcome to email Dr. Conister or myself or Julie or Molly and you know just see, um, hey, I'm thinking here, does this one seem like it fits? And we're happy to answer those questions as you're as you're going through the internship search process. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Other questions. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the IBH website in the chat for sure. Spend a lot of time there, so easy peasy. <laughs> well, if no one has any other immediate questions, we might get to play Julie's favorite videos, so which are great. They're awesome videos. <laughs> uh, oh, Kenny has a question. Yes, Kenny, go ahead. Yes. Uh... 
I did, I had the I put the question in the chat as well. But um, so um, the, um I'm a Spanish speaker, right? Who uh, would want to work with Spanish speaking communities or like you know um undocumented communities. Uh, but let's say that the agency doesn't um, necessarily qualify, right? Uh, could I still apply and and kind of see what happens? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Definitely apply. And it's likely that any agency that you're working at um, that is serving those communities would be would apply well. I'd say the one times that it probably it often doesn't it, or is less likely to is usually if you're like in a community college or, you know, like a college setting, college counseling, that kind of thing, like those those settings tend to um like we have once or twice, I think, approved a site like that, but it, it's it doesn't necessarily fall under the under resource piece of it. And it's we can sometimes make it, you know, if it's if it's a high school, it's youth, so we can bring it in that way. Um, but I think that's right. Unless Julie, let me know if I'm misspeaking. But I think absolutely. I I just want to stress that the the federally qualified health centers that we posted that are in San Francisco and in Alameda County do not include all the FQHCs in our Bay Area. And so, for example, Daily City Youth Health Center, and we have Anya here to talk about it, is an FQHC in Daily City. Um, and so you may find yourself in a, in a place that um, definitely is integrated behavioral health site um, that isn't on our list. I'm not sure exactly if that's why you're asking, but um, I think also I would agree with Dr. O in that community colleges, sometimes we have to look a little closer, but sometimes they have integrated wellness centers and things like that, yeah. um, that, that can very much um, align with the mission of the grant. So I think most importantly, just check in with us about the site if you're not sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and for the interest okay. of time, we just sort of highlighted the the counties we work in the most often. But yeah, like Daly City, different county. Absolutely. We've got a partner. Someone right now is getting the grant and is down in San Jose area. Um, but we don't have that many people there. So we don't usually talk about those ones as much. But yeah, all there. Yeah, that's a super good point. And sorry, Kenny, I think I cut you off. No, I, I think that's exactly what I was asking uh, for, like, example, like right now I'm at a, a site, a integrated kind of like wellness site, career site. Mm -hmm. And, um, I'm, you know, I, I do will have, right, the opportunity to work with uh, undocumented students, um, like prior undocumented myself. So it's kind of like a community that I want to work with. Sure. Um, but th the next site that I could probably go into will be also a college. And the reason why I was asking is because mm. it could like, let's say, for example, like a college in Marin, which is kind of like, you know, well off. Right. Uh, but, you know, they also have the communities. Right. Kind of like uh, in Canal or like kind of like in the San Rafael, San Rafael mm -hmm. area. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I was, that's why I was asking. But, you know, I could also look at other sites as well. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, for sure in the, you know, definitely apply, we will say like we, we try to give this, we don't ever want to sit on money, right? So if there is, if we can give you the money we want to, and so, you know, look at the priorities of the grant and tell us how, right? Like if your role at, if say you are at College of Marin, if your role though is working with the undocumented community within there and helping them access integrated care, then that's right. Like that would be one of those exceptions where it's maybe not necessarily the place, but the work that you're doing is aligned with the grant, right? Or maybe you're like, I'm, I'm thinking like maybe there's, um, I used to work in Sonoma State. And so like, there's there's like the people who live in Sonoma that are like, you know, that like t tend to be thinking of like well-resourced and that, but then there's a lot of farm workers there, right? Migrant workers in that space that are really underserved. And so, you know, if that's the specialty population that you are working with as a Spanish speaker, <laughs> then, then yeah, talk about that in your application for us. Be as explicit as you can. Yeah, and I just also want to emphasize that integrated behavioral health <clears throat> is a very is a spectrum, and at one end, it's very clearly all in one center, and there's primary care, and there's dental care, and many maybe some of you have been in those settings, but there's also other forms of integrated care on this continuum, and so we're really asking you to think about this site that you're looking at and the degree to which there's integration with other professionals, right? The degree to which you're doing interdisciplinary work and working as a team, because that's really the core of integrated behavioral health is team-based care. Everybody's sharing a similar goal, working with the, the patient, client, consumer, whatever that context refers to them, um, and, and, and working as a team. So that's, again, spectrum, you know? Mm -hmm. 
And I pop this into the chat, but I'll just chime in too from the education perspective of things is also uh, the priorities of the grant is to serve youth, which does include those transitional age youth. So folks that, you know, maybe in a college setting. And so I think, you know, again, just reaching out to us if you do have a specific placement in mind, um, because as we all know that the majority of youth receive their services through school-based settings, you know, so that is the integration inherent when we are looking at youth, the importance of the education system, whether it be a K-12 or a post-secondary education space. So not to suggest that those institutions wouldn't apply. We're just saying sometimes like a very heavily resourced institution, education, you know, institution may or may not, right? But without doubt, like transitional age youth are within that umbrella of who this grant is prioritizing. So um, I know a lot of school counseling folks in the past have thought, oh, in integrated behavioral health, I don't do this work in a school, but you absolutely do. As Julie just mentioned, we are Con, you know, continuously working in a multidisciplinary way when we're working in education settings and in behavioral health. So I do encourage you to remember too that that the youth spectrum does involve our young adults as well. Do you think we have time? Let's see, 142. Rita isn't here yet, I don't think. So sure, go ahead, we'll play yeah. and then. <laughs> For over 30 years at San Francisco Community Health Center, we've been striving and we have been providing the most comprehensive continuum of care not just for the HIV community, but for the LGBTQ community, the trans community, and most recently the homeless community. This is our goal, is to ensure that we have as comprehensive, as holistic, and whole person-centered care as possible. Here at San Francisco Community Health Center, we treat the whole person. Our team uh, complies uh, behavioral health, dental, case management, outreach workers, the medical providers, of course, programs, even the people who cook the meals for our patients. I think what makes San Francisco Community Health Center so magical is that there's really nothing like this anywhere else. Our philosophy as an organization is that we never give up. We do whatever it takes to serve our clients in the most comprehensive, culturally competent manner possible. From the minute that I walked into this clinic, I knew that it was different because of the sense of community that this clinic offers. There is nowhere else that you can arrive and be greeted by somebody who looks like you or who has had a similar experience as you, who can connect you to a provider who's just gonna be super responsive to your needs. Being able to come in here without feeling any type of stigma, without feeling like I'm less than or ostracized or just being picked on for being who I was is the greatest reward. 20 years ago, when I came out as who I am, there were really no services available and I was seeking services for myself. And when I landed here at San Francisco Community Health Center, I just kind of like opened a treasure chest where all of these services are available for me. And I want each and every one who comes to our door to experience that. Our outreach team is grounded in the fact that our clients' needs are urgent. My team works with some of the hardest to reach. The folks here in, in San Francisco in the Tenderloin that are suffering incredibly. And we do the most amazing job because I have a talented, skillful, compassionate, empathic team. You know, imagine you're this person who lives outside in a tent, who has so much distrust in the medical system because you've been turned away and turned away, you know, time after time when you've tried to get help and your things were stolen the night before, you haven't slept, you don't have any food and someone from our team approaches you to try and give you something that you actually need and make you feel like your life is valued because we actually bring our services to the, the folks that we serve out in the community on our outreach team. 
actually going and finding people and meeting them where they are and really taking the resources and knowledge and information that we have. And we tell them that we'll be back tomorrow if you're not ready to come in yet. We remind them that their life matters. There's a special sauce here at San Francisco Community Center. What we do together when we're here in our office is we celebrate, we laugh together, and we actually create a culture of joy. All right, so we wanted to show you all that just so that you could see these are the kind of spaces that we're hoping that you all will be doing your placements and eventually being employed in, right? Places that are doing this amazing work. Um, so now we're gonna shift it over to hearing from our community partners. Um, I just wanna double check, I don't think Rita is here yet. Rita, you can unmute and tell me if I'm wrong if you are here. Um, and so we're actually, Anya, if you'd be all right with with um, getting us kicked off um, and then and then we'll start moving moving through our list. Absolutely not a problem. Um, how much time do I have just so I can squeeze it in? Ideally about five minutes. Okay, I will do my best. Um, can I ask a quick question first? Would you all like me to stop sharing screens so we can all be more community? Is that okay? Um, and I uh, welcome any uh, specific questions as I talk. You can just uh, raise your hand and hopefully I'll spot you. So uh, my name is Anya Shapiro. I'm the executive director at the Daily City Youth Health Center. Uh, we are located not too far from SF State. I would say about a 10 minute drive at most. And we are uh, have a really robust behavioral health program. Uh, where we serve youth within um, serious mental illness uh, needs, as well as mild to moderate. Uh, a majority of our clients are uh, BIPOC. We have a huge newcomer population. Um, and uh, I think an, a special part of our program for interns uh, is this varied uh, experience component. So you all could uh, get a get an experience providing services within a clinic setting uh, that mimics a little bit of like a community center or private practice. You can also get an experience in working in schools uh, as a school-based provider. And we serve elementary, middle, and high schools. So you have your choice if you have a preference in age group. Uh, and we also serve the Tay population. So anywhere from six to 25 years old. Uh, we are... Uh, also do some crisis assessment and everything is uh, taught and trained to you all. So it, uh, it is quite doable. Um, and so there's a variety of things that you're able to then speak to when you're talking to future ex employers that you have experienced. Uh, this also includes Medi-Cal billing. Uh, I'll be really transparent. It is not anything anyone likes. However, if you're going to be in community mental health, it is something that's really important to learn how to do. So uh, we provide really extensive training. We oversee all of the documentation. Um, and so by the end of the year, it's easy peasy. It's old hat for you all. And you look really marketable to employers. Um, and here's where I dissuade you from coming to our program. We, our program is hard, y'all. It's really, really challenging. You will work really, 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 really hard. Um, so if you have a, an unreasonable year and you're not looking to work really, really, really hard, don't come to us. Um, having said that, I would say that you also get in, uh, get out what you put in to the program. So we have a really robust training component to our program. Uh, we are very family systems focused. We really believe that to help young people, we need to address the system that they're coming from. They are not existing in and of themselves. They bring a lot of relational pain uh, with them. And even though they're individuating as young adults, um, it, it's really difficult to do that in a healthy and successful way without addressing their relational pain and, and also without having people behind them that are support their support. Um, so we do a robust training on family systems and this includes a one-way mirror. Um, so you have, I know it sounds really scary when I first say it, when you first think about it, but it's actually lovely because your supervisor is literally inside your head, not literally, figuratively, um, that would hurt. 
no, but so you, what we do with our one-way mirror training is you have uh, your team of your peers uh, behind the mirror and you have a supervisor guiding you throughout the entire session. And so you kind of almost don't even have to think very much. Um, and so you, and you also don't really have to worry about your performance. You're not just being observed and judged. Somebody is guiding you, somebody who's an expert. And, uh, and then the session um, ends up being really, uh, you know, the way you hoped that, that, that it would go usually. Um, and then the team switches places and there's a reflecting team presenting uh, observations to the family. And this is a really valuable intervention where the family gets to see themselves in a really strength-based reflected way. Um, and the, the reflecting team says the things that usually the therapist doesn't get to say to their clients uh, because we don't tell them what to do, right? Um, and so it, it's about six months worth of work is what I've observed in one session. And the best thing about it for the interns is we all work best, we all learn best in, in, in vivo style where you're actually learning in the moment rather than kind of thinking about uh, something that happened and talking about it with someone later. Um, so we find that our trainees feel more confident and are more impactful and have really good success rates faster because they're uh, being supervised and trained in this way. But it is more challenging. It's more scary. It's, you know, and, and all of that. So if uh, if that sounds too anxiety producing, then maybe this year is not the year to apply to us. But um, if you are looking for a super challenging program and you're looking to really learn as much as possible and you want to work with families because that is a necessary component of our program, then I invite you to join us. Um, in particular, we really need uh, Spanish and Tagalog uh, speakers. Uh, at any uh, BIPOC and bilingual folks are encouraged to apply. Uh, we want to really reflect the community that we serve. We also usually have a really uh, decent stipend. It's based on grants. So I never know until after, like until mid-year, sometime later, when most of our folks have already been hired, how much it's going to be. But uh, last year it was, I believe, about $12,000. And this year it's about $10,000. And we'll see what's being offered, right? So I can't promise um, anything. It could be much smaller. Uh, so I don't want to mislead anyone. Um, most of our staff are former trainees. So the environment is really great. People tend to like uh, where they are uh, within our program and they want to stay. We don't have a very high turnover rate uh, and we have folks that are hoping to, to get hired. So I'm uh, pretty proud of our um, little family feel and, and the way that people are supported and the way that people are trained. So uh, it, it is undeniably really, really challenging and hard work, but uh, folks who feel like they're in the right place when they get there tend to want to stay. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Anya. We really appreciate you you showing up and and, and kicking us off here. Um, so if it's all right, I'm going to turn it over to Rita Perez now Is that, um, from SF Health Network Primary Care Services. I'm going to add her as a spotlight. Oh, except it just moved on me. You got to love how Zoom moves things. Here we Hi, go. Hi, Rita. Yeah, love the community that we have here. <laughs> awesome. All right. Thank you so much. And uh, Anya, it was really nice to see you and hear you and you share about your program, I was thinking, I'm like, oh my God, I'm like, I'm going to sound so similar to Anya because I was going to start with what we are not. Um, so San Francisco Health Network is Integrated Behavioral Health Services. We are not specialty mental health. We do not do 50 minute sessions. We do not have individual private offices. We do not have protected time. You can expect to get a lot of interruptions. We don't do processing. We are very problem focused on the reason for referral. So we're seeking um, solutions. So. If what you're looking for is traditional outpatient mental health therapy, we are not the site for you. If, however, you would like to um, really get involved and learn about integrated behavioral health services, be a part of a medical team, you have a commitment for reducing health disparities, you have flexibility, you like a fast pace, 
then we are the site for you. Um, you will learn how to chart an electronic healthcare record system, which is EPIC. You'll be, um, as I mentioned, a part of the medical team involved in huddles. You'll be looked at as, um, as the expert in behavioral health services and providing consultation to the medical team. Um, you will be assessments and screenings um, using some of our standard tools, PHQ-9, the GAD-7, the Audit-C. We've got a range of them that we're, we're working with. Um, we, we don't, our, our documentation is very different than traditional mental health. So we're not in the Medi-Cal, um, it's not as stringent as Medi-Cal. Um, Epic also has some wonderful features to really help cut down the documentation time. Um, we have very uh, set hours of eight to five with very protected time around lunch. Doctors are very, very good about protecting their lunch time. Um, referrals that you would get in working with our patients um, are related to everything from traditional anxiety, depression, to um, helping individuals, helping the patients that are experiencing chronic pain, um, insomnia, having difficulty adhering to their medical treatment plan, um, a recent diagnosis of diabetes, um, it, it ranges. So it's an opportunity to really get into the healthcare system, learn more about that and how to work it, how to work and be a part of a team. So, and we, we've got um, two of your um, fellow classmates that are currently with us. So please feel free to reach out to them. Um, Tulia, oh my God, I'm blanking on her last name. Yeah. And Tori, you, thank you. And Tori Thomas. So they can tell you firsthand on their experience. Um, they, uh, Tulia is at Chinatown Public Health Center and Tori is at Southeast uh, Family Health Center, which will also be another internship site for this next coming year. Awesome, thank you so much, Rita. Next up, we're gonna add, and we're gonna bring in Oakland Unified. So I'm trying to add Heather and Elizabeth here because you are our co-folks uh, co at OUSD, right? So, um, go. And yeah, if you want to take it away for us, good to see you both. Thank you for having us. Do you want to get started, Heather? Or do you want me to get started? You take the lead, Elizabeth. Okay, awesome. Heather and I are a team. Um, so we are so excited to be here to talk to you all about amazing opportunities in Oakland and Oakland Unified School District. Um, Heather and I tag team together um, to bring in our amazing interns into Oakland schools. Um, I coordinate our school counseling services and, and placement. Heather coordinates our clinical placements. Um, in the district, we have a wealth of school opportunities, different supervisor opportunities. Um, we're always looking for uh, potential interns who are passionate about serving people, passionate about mental health, feel ready to make a difference. A few things that you should know about Oakland, we are a community schools district. We are a restorative justice district. We are a district with a lot of complex needs. Um, but also a lot of spirit and a lot of amazing students, families, educators who work really, really hard every day to make a difference for Oakland students and families. Um, so whether you are looking for a school only placement, a school and clinical placement, a clinical only placement, we are your people. Um, you can connect with either Heather or myself and I and we will connect you to the right folks. Um, on the school counseling end, we usually have you interview at two sites and then we'll land on one together. Um, because of this amazing partnership with SF State, we're able to um, for folks who are doing school and some kind of clinical pathway, we're able to offer clinical supervision regardless of your site. Um, so if you want to do a school counseling, but you also want to do your hours, you can do that in OUSD. Heather, do you want to talk a little bit about what the clinical placements would look like? Sure. Um, thanks, Elizabeth. And it's nice to see you all. We love our partnership with San Francisco State. We always have great MFT interns in you all. And that's something that's always an option. If you wanna hear about an experience from one of your classmates in our program in our cohort, we can set that up as well. Cause I always like for folks to hear about what they're stepping into. Um, I think something that stands apart for us is that we really work hard to train you all 
to support you all and to, to take feedback seriously about the intern experience. That's my entire role actually is coordinating um, traineeships and internships. And so we really can cater to what you need out of this learning experience and make sure students and families get the services that they need and deserve. So we really hold those two things um, and take that very seriously. Some of the trainings that are really robust, um, we're walking in, soon we'll be in January, that will be our um, healing centered training. So we're gonna have expressive arts, play therapy, group work. Um, and so we bring in folks doing the work in the field to come in and train for us. So you get to hear from a lot of professionals and learn and grow in a cohort of learners. So come join us. Thank you both so much. Really appreciate it. I'm sure folks will have questions for you or maybe in the chat as well as we go through. So, all right. So next up, we're going to turn over to Lance Dwyer from San Francisco Community Health Clinic. And I, I don't know, it just keeps moving on. Here we go. Add in the spotlights. There we go. Hi, everybody. Good to see, um, good to be with you all, including some familiar faces. Heather and I actually went to school together, class of 2012 at Cal. And yeah, it's a good reunion here. Um, I can I share my screen actually? Is that is that okay? Just to share it, and I can link to this too. I'm just kind of visual person. Um, first thing, I guess, first thing off the top, my name is Lance Dwyer. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I've been I'm the associate director of mental health here at uh, San Francisco Community Health Center. And I guess a couple of things off the top. We we um, this is a relatively new partnership with SF State, but it's been a great partnership, and um, so much so that one of our um, one of my new hires within the last year, it's Kai Albert, who was um, in the program, I guess, I guess graduated 20, class of 2023. Yeah. So, so I guess as others were sharing too, just that's someone you can reach out to if you want to hear about her experiences. And, and I, I guess it's a good testament. Um, you know, we loved having her, want to continue to have her obviously. And so she wanted to continue on with us too, and she's doing great here. So um, yeah, so that's off the top. Also, I've been here for 11 years um, total. So I think that's another kind of a testament to the organization and how I believe in the organization. So we're a community health center. We keep adding new programs. And so I, I definitely can't even list all the different services we have, but we're pretty comprehensive. We have about five or six sites now. Um, so one is our new Trans Thrive Center, which is just up the road at 1460 Pine Street. 6,000 square foot space, standalone space for trans and gender non-conforming folks. And so it's, I think it's, it's the biggest or like really the only kind of drop-in that exists in the country for, for that target population. So that's really exciting. We, of course, we're a federally qualified health center. So we do have primary care, comprehensive medical care, dental, and of course, behavioral health and, and uh, mental health. So the, the, behavioral health kind of includes case management and therapy, which I oversee mostly the therapists. We have about 10 therapists, um, five are licensed, five are associates, um, associates or AMFTs, uh, actually just, just Kai, who's our um, um, AMFT. So um, yeah, so team of about 10 folks providing therapy and we have a really just like an incredible range of, of clients that we get to work with. I like to say this, just that, my case on alone, I have somebody who has been chronically unhoused, um, in recovery, sort of struggling with and more successful at times with with um, um, addiction and substance use. Um, so I have, you know, someone like that I've been working with for six years. And then I have somebody who um, comes to us with has a master's degree as a business, maybe, you know, qualifies for a Medi-Cal because of their income. Um, but, you know, quote unquote, high, high, high functioning and, and um, yeah, so my, my case in particular, and I think everyone just kind of runs the gamut of, um, of different needs and different types of personalities. Um, and we have all different types of different services. And so this is just kind of giving a, this visual is kind of a idea of some of the services we have. Um, so some of the primary responsibilities, clinical services, as I said, for a diverse panel of therapy clients. Um, you can definitely, Kai developed a group and she's still running a couple of groups right now too. So you have the opportunity to, to see a need and develop a group. Um, and then optional case management experience if, if someone's interested in, in getting that experience. Kai actually was interested in some of the gender affirming care um, that we provide those assessments. So um, we, uh, training wise, we have of course weekly individual supervision group supervision, and then weekly case consultation. Uh, we have a psychiatrist psychiatrist who um, provides uh, consultation weekly. 
And then we have our internal SFCHC Academy. So there's a training kind, kind of maybe every other week or so, different opportunities for various types of trainings. Um, we have a ton of different social workers and therapists, like I said, on site and a wealth of knowledge internally too. So folks have the opportunity to set up informational meetings and just get to know, um, drop in the wealth of knowledge that we have internally. Um, we do have a stipend of $2,500. So that's $1,250 per paid out per semester. So that's one thing. Um, yeah, I think that's that's pretty much all I, I can send the link to this this too. Um, yeah, that's awesome. If you want to put it in the chat and um, yeah. you know, we could even add it to our website as well. So thank you so much, Lance. We really appreciate it. Great. Um, and yeah, I know Kai had such a good experience there. She was in my internship class and was telling oh. me all about it. So. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, and clearly she stayed working with you. So yeah. Yeah. awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lance. Really Thank appreciate you. it. All right. Next up, we're going to turn it over to Danny Marchman from Lifelong, um, who's going to tell us about that opportunity. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. So um, Lifelong Medical Care is also an FQHC. We're located in Alameda and Contra Costa counties. And our school-based programs are primarily in Alameda County. We have elementary and middle school placements for our students. We have a long running internship program where we've been supporting students to really learn some fantastic clinical skills, especially um, some of the really challenging things to do with the very little ones in our elementary schools, which require some special care, some child-centered therapy that we're doing there. And some of the things that we offer our students, and I'm gonna put this in the chat, as well. Um, we have several opportunities for training. We have a weekly didactic program for all of our students. We have a really interesting cohort across our clinics and our school-based programs. So students learn from each other, but usually we have at least three uh, students together in our school-based programs, and they get to also meet and learn from our students in our other integrated health clinics where we meet weekly and talk about uh, didactic topics on clinical training skills that run the gamut for adult work and child work. Um, let's see if I can get this in the chat. It's not going in. Um, and we also have a LCSW who's on site at the school, helping the students really put their skills to the test with the students there. We also run groups. Um, we do some social skills groups, some therapeutic groups with the kiddos at the sites. And there's lots of room for creativity. Um, we love to hear from our students about areas where they wanna learn and grow in terms of individual or group work and that we can support them in, you know, maybe there's a particular kind of group that they'd like to run the site with the kids. Um, sorry, I think my computer is a little frozen here. What's very exciting for our site this next year is we actually have intern stipends that will be available for our second year students, uh, $10,000. It's very exciting that we're able to offer um, that to our second year students that will be joining us. Uh, we're really also very much committed to DEIB work and part of the student experience for this year, next year, and going forward. Special DEIB trainer and consultant that's helping our students really grapple with issues of cross-cultural therapeutic work how to talk about identity with patients, how to talk to patients about their identity, and how to really grapple with some of the anti-racist work that we're really trying to do both organizationally and in the community and school settings in which we work. So very excited about some of the resources that we have to bring to bear for that as well. Um, I'm gonna keep trying to put it in the chat, but my computer's present, um, but I'll make sure, oh, here we go, that you have this information. And uh, unless there's any questions, that's Lifelong Medical. Thank you so much. And yeah, I saw Molly put this in the chat, but I'm loving all these stipends that are coming up. It's really, really cool. Um, and so um, actually in, in the interest of time, I think if there's questions, if we could keep them to the chat, um, because we've got, I think, uh, five more folks to get through before <laughs> we hop to um, that. Um, and if there's time at the end, then we can do a verbal ones. So next up, I'm going to bring on the SF Unified uh, School District. So the school counseling aspect and also the student intervention team will do bring you both up at the same time, just like we did for Oakland. Um, and let me bring Ling Bush and Carol. Um, thank, hi, Carol. Hi, Ling. Good to see you. Hi. Um, yeah. Tell us about SF Unified opportunities. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. Um, so my name is Carol Chow Herring, and I'm one of the clinical supervisors for the PCC mental health portion of the um, graduate degree program. So, um, and I work with 
the husband of somebody else in this room. So I, was, I texted him to let him know that you were, we were on this phone call together. Um, and uh, Ling, I'll let you introduce yourself. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Ling Bush. I am a lead counselor. Um, I am the coordinator and I support um, placements for PPS school counseling internships. And I work really closely with Carol and the SIT team. We're going to talk a little bit about the work that we do for both of our respective programs and how we've actually kind of come together to synergize around a dual credential placement. Yeah. And we're actually offering stipends as well next year, which is really exciting and is partially because of this grant from SF State. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, uh, so I'll talk a little bit about um, SIT and what we do. Um, so the San Francisco Unified School District uh, serves about 50,000 students, although that number keeps decreasing each year <laughs> since the pandemic. But, um, uh, you know, we have a very diverse population and we the SIT team is comprised of three clinical supervisors, and we um, send about 40 interns to 35 sites. People also get their PPSC um, hours through us, and uh, we partner with the school social workers who are on site to provide that day-to-day -day, um, mentorship and support, as well as uh, clinical supervision when they have their license. And when they don't have their license, the SIT team will provide clinical supervision for you. Um, we, uh, we do a lot of different things as school-based people, and we invite a lot of different types of degrees into our program. Um, and the reason for that is because I think we all have so much to learn from each other and to learn from the different perspectives that the different schools teach. Um, what I think is really special about our program in particular is um, our supervision structure. So I would love to show you a slide of what our supervision structure looks like. So, um, so a lot of the internship activities that we do um, will depend on what your needs and your learning plan are. We take a lot of care in matching you to the site that you go to. So some of our interns really want to learn to do the individual clinical therapy piece. Um, others are interested in becoming school-based social workers or counselors afterwards. Um, and so we really look at what do you want to do with your career and how do we um, maximize the opportunities that you have to be able to get the experience, the on the ground experience so that you can actually go into the workforce um, when you graduate. Um, and so, uh, you know, just to, to share, I was a SIT intern um, 13 years ago and then stayed with SFUSD ever since. And so I bring a lot of that wanting to be able to give people the on the skills ground uh, on the ground skills into the way that I supervise. Um, so as I was saying, what I think really makes our program stand out is our supervision model, which may be similar to other people's as well, but we have the site supervision where you work with your school-based site person who tells you about the culture of the school that, you know, you, you talk with them about your caseload. Um, you, you watch them. They're one of your role models. Um, and they, they teach you about like the day-to-day -day ins and outs of being on a school site. And then you have your individual clinical supervisor who supports you with um, your BBS hours and um, thinking through your caseload uh, in a clinical um, framework. Then we also offer group supervision, two hours a week, and that's with the SIT team. And that's a mix of grade levels because one of the amazing things about working in schools is that you get the full developmental timeline from early ed, you know, our three-year-old, our youngest learners to um, 18, our, our seniors, and sometimes beyond, depending on what program they're in. Um, and so it's been really great in our uh, to have these group supervision spaces where you, again, get the mix of the different degrees and the mix of the grade levels so that you can also, through osmosis, hear about and learn about um, the different developmental stages. Um, and then also we have intern specific trainings that we offer one to two per month. And these are the topics that come up most years, but um, we just did a play therapy training and we're going to be bringing some sensory strategies training to work with our neurodiverse learners, uh, drama therapy training. So we are always looking for ways to also train your supervisors as well. So um, this morning, actually, I just did a supervisor's training. And so our um, model is really around trying to create uh, 
clinically minded school-based health practitioners, right? School-based mental health practitioners, because school-based mental health is different than agency mental health. Somebody else already said, it's not always the 50 minute hour. Sometimes we're playing basketball. Sometimes we're walking around the track. Sometimes we're coloring, right? I feel like 90% of my work in elementary schools is arts and crafts, you know? But um, I think we, throughout it all, we're trying to infuse the activities that you're doing at school with the understanding of what you're doing clinically, right? I just had a site visit today where someone was like, we, I took this play-based training and I realized that I've been doing play therapy my whole life. I just didn't know what it was called, right? And so we do a lot of trying to connect theory to practice. Um, let's see. And uh, we have a whole scope and sequence, but oh, I know what I wanted to share. Uh, we have a landing page with a lot of frequently asked questions, so I won't take up time now because I want to make sure Ling has time, but I'll put it in the chat so you can see if your questions are answered in there. Thank you, Carol. Um, I'll talk a little bit about our PPS program and then Carol and I can, what, right, Carol, should we, then we can talk about finishing yeah. off the dual credential. Um, so I coordinate the placements for the mm -hmm. PPS school counseling um, program, and we work really closely with our school-based counselors. We welcome a lot of San Francisco State students um, every year. And we don't provide the central supervision, but we do work with the site supervisors to ensure that you know our students are getting everything that they need. And they're exploring the world of school counseling um, across three domains, academic, college and career, and the social emotional. Um, so I, I think that it's been a great opportunity just over the years working closely with counselors and seeing their interns really become integrated into the school community. So whenever we have like workshops or trainings that are available to the school counselors, they often bring their interns. And we've seen so many kind of full circle come um, to work uh, for our district, which we're really grateful for. Um, I think what is really exciting is last year, we really wanted to better articulate the dual credential program because we're seeing a lot of students who are doing both. And it's it, it's amazing because they have that skill set and they're also able to really learn from a school-based perspective where the roles intersect, where they differ and really how to develop strong collaboration. So um, we since we are really familiar and we've been in the district for a long time and really know our folks, we're able to um, make really, I think, thoughtful placements with SIT and with um, PPS or the dual credential. And um, yeah, we're continuing to work to kind of articulate that better. Carol, do you want to say more about? Um, no, I mean, I think you captured it. I this is This is our specialized placement description, and we continually refine it as um, and it's on the landing page if you want to read more, just so that you know it exists there. But uh, we meet with the universities a lot. But I will say SF State has been a joy to work with. I think you're, they really support you in getting that full holistic experience, which I've really appreciated because that's how I operate um, as a clinician as well. And so, um, you know, we we have Michelle Hoang, who, Hoang who's um, there right now. And uh, just has had a really positive ex experience, and we're actually picking their brain in like how to make it a great program. So you know, we just yeah, we really love working with you, and we hope that you're able to come join us at SFUSD. Thank you so much, Carolyn Ling. We really appreciate you all and the work you do, and would agree it's a joy working with you as well. <laughs> so next, we're going to bring up uh, Manuel Arredondo and Evelyn. Um, we're going to come and talk about La Clinica. So let me just bring Evelyn Riley up here. Uh, I'll let Ling and Carol be off the spotlight. <laughs> um, all right, La Clinica, take us away. Hopefully you can uh, all see my everyone? screen. Oh. <laughs> You're good, Manuel. Go ahead, Evelyn. Uh, thank you, everyone. You... It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting us back. Hopefully you can all see my screen. If not, I'll also be sure to share this. My name is Evelyn Riley. I'm the Behavioral Health Internship and Recruitment Coordinator at La Clinica. Really here to just support and pro um, provide support with any questions you might have about us. 
La Clinica is uh, one of the largest community health centers in California. We've been around for over 48 years. Um, our goal really is to provide culturally and linguistically appropriate, high quality and accessible health care for all. We offer a variety of supervised field work placement opportunities, um, but the one we'll be focusing on today is integrated behavioral health. Kind of at an overview, um, our IBH placement um, is located both in the primary care setting and um, in a variety of school-based health centers um, and really providing access to behavioral health assessments and brief therapy uh, for patients. Um, we have uh, locations in Alameda, Contra Costa, and Solano counties. I'm gonna give a little overview of the training and then I will hand it over to Manuel to talk a little bit more about working at IBH. So our uh, placements are offered to first and second year students. Uh, we use evidence-based culturally responsive practices in the field. All interns participate in a weekly didactic component that covers a broad range of topics. We also offer mentorship opportunities um, and career development opportunities. Um, the requirement uh, is that we require that first years do 20 hours per week. We know this is slightly more than what usual universities require, but we really find that it makes a big difference in being able to connect and meet patient needs and also uh, with the additional trainings that we provide. Um, and then second years, it's 24 hours per week. La Clinica does offer a stipend. We're really grateful that we're able to do this. Um, 12,880 for the first years and 16,000 for second years. And this is over the course of the entire school year. Um, we also offer travel stipends to help folks um, meet their uh, commute needs. Um, I know this is kind of all really spitfire. And so if you are interested in learning more, I encourage you to either check out our website or join us for our info sessions. They will be at the end of January um, and we'll be able to, you'll be able to talk to our clinicians. We'll do a whole hour deep dive into this, um, show you how to apply, things like that. Feel free to email us uh, on this and also be sure to share this flyer with um, Julie so it can be circulated. And now I'm gonna hand it off to Manuel to speak more about IBH. Oh, I'm not even sure what to add, Evelyn. That was so awesome. Thank you. And I know we've heard from multiple IBH sites already. Um, I would just point out that IBH Integrated Behavioral Health is an awesome model. It's really focused on health outcomes. It's a real chance to affect. It's a. It's actually a community level intervention. Um, the 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 transformation from just treating individuals and pathologizing their individual presentation versus looking how can we impact the community as a whole in the primary care setting is really, really special. It's really awesome work. It's transformative. If you're even a little bit curious about it, I really recommend that you look into it more at our site or at any of, a Lifelong is one of our sister sites. They do amazing work. This, the places in San Francisco we heard from are also sound amazing. Um, geographically, I think that's relevant. If you're interested in practicing in Vallejo or Contra Costa County, Concord, Pittsburgh, Oakley, um, we do provide opportunities in those parts of the Bay, which are underserved and also amazing communities to connect with. Um, and we also have spaces in East Oakland, including school-based health centers, like Evelyn mentioned, um, uh, Fruitvale area and further east. Um, so if that geography speaks to you, I think we have a lot in common in terms of the presentations you've heard around our dedication towards a rigorous training program. It is the real deal. It's, it's the delivery of medical care, it's the delivery of health services. So there is a sort of a high level of expectation around performance, um, but it's also awesome work. Um, and if you're interested in networking, um, La Clinica is a great place just because of our reach throughout the different counties. Um, you get to connect with a lot of people from a lot of different places. Um, yeah, and big shout out to you, Evelyn. Honestly, that was awesome. I think you said everything. If anyone has any questions, I'd say just reach out to us. Don't hesitate to email. Even if you're a little bit curious, um, it, it's, uh, we'd be happy to share more with you. Thank you so much, Evelyn and Manuela. Yeah, we love the work that you do at La Clinica and are so happy that you all shared with us and came here today. Um, so next up, we're going to throw it over to Katie Nicole from Planned Parenthood, um, who is one of our other partners. Switch it over. Hey, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Katie Nicole, pronoun she, her from Planned Parenthood of Northern California. And I'm happy to name that we have a um, student program that's been quite robust for quite a few number of years. And then this past year, we actually um, increased our numbers of students. So we currently have six students across 
um, eight health centers in total because some students are doing dual centers. We are a mild to moderate mental health provider and the, the issues around um, sexual reproductive health and access are really salient issues that many of our patients are able to um, address with their patients. We offer both on the spot crisis intervention and counseling for what we would kind of call warm handoff referrals if a patient is accessing their healthcare in one of our settings and health centers and then you know names that they would like some support around their coping we're available to do that as well as ongoing supportive counseling weekly sessions um and I would say that our students are having a really good experience this year we don't offer stipends which is a real bummer um we were granted one um supportive um a grant award, but that was only for two students that are operating out of our Solano County centers. Um, so we're always looking for funding opportunities to, to support our students. And I would say, um, oh, and then supervision structure, we offer group supervision once a week on Monday mornings, and then of course, individual supervision units um, as needed per the student's caseload. Um, and what else can I tell you? I think that's pretty much all the the various components of our program. I'm always delighted to work with students. I love supervision. Um, I've been in LCSW for 20 years now, and I still find the work so rewarding with students. It's always it's always so refreshing for me as a as a practicing therapist. So it's nice to connect with y'all here. I love it. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, great. So yeah, and I think. Um, unless I'm wrong, I don't think Naomi was able to make it today. Julie, have you? Yeah, uh, I don't see her. So um, I think we can probably just, we have what, three minutes left. So maybe there's other questions. Yeah, yeah, great. Thank you. So yeah, any any questions in our last two minutes now left? And I'll remove the spotlights from us so we can see everyone together. I see. Um, is it Alyssa? It is, great job. <laughs> um, yes, I have a question. I have an emphasis in gerontology. So I was wondering if there are any of these sites that um, offer opportunities to work with elders in the communities primarily. You know, I believe other than 80 for Planned Parenthood, all our partners have dropped off. Or Anya, you're here. So sorry. Um, so I think we can probably try to give an answer to that. But I will also just give you a larger answer in terms of integrated behavioral health grant project. So the, the funding we receive for integrated behavioral health training is designed to focus on training students to work with youth, um, children up to transition age youth. However, if you are finding yourself in an integrated behavioral health site, for example, La Clinica or Lifelong or uh, Daily City Youth, and um, that is a population that you're working with, I suspect that that would account would count um, <clears throat> but just working with older adults, although I just want to acknowledge how important it is to work with older adults, we don't do enough in our program and I want you to do that. Um, but if you're working in a community setting that's not integrated only with older adults and we have more than 29 applicants, you might not make it, but talk to us offline yeah. because we want to support you. And we, say, well, yeah, can I, I know within the, the integrated behavioral health sites, just because I've had some students at some of these places, lifelong tends to have some where, where there's more focus, right? Because it's lifelong, right? So they've got folks though, across the whole spectrum. And so you would be in an FQHC, just not doing the youth piece of it. Um, and then there's also like right now, my student that is working with uh, Rita's group, right? The, um, uh, SF Health Network Primary Care Services. Um, they are working with primarily folks over the age of 50 um, in there, but that is um, 
they're there because they speak Cantonese or uh, Mandarin, uh, Mandarin. <laughs> and so, so that, that spot, so, uh, you know, it's, it's the language piece might get in there, but I know um, in, in the, uh, what is it, the SF Health Network Primary Care Services, there's, there's some of those spaces that, um, that is the integrated, it's very integrated behavioral health. It is an FQHC, and I think they're likely to have some uh, JARO kind of focus potentially that you could access. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. I see folks are hopping off. It's 2.31 and I like to be respectful of everyone's time. So thank you everyone for coming. And um, thank you, Brenna, for your cat being there. That's beautiful. <laughs> so I uh, oh, hope yeah. everyone <laughs> has a wonderful break. Thanks for coming out. And yeah, reach out to any of us with any questions. We're always happy to talk with you more. Thank, thank you for so being much. here and doing this work. Be well. Bye, everyone. Have a good break. Bye.